Hello, this is the devotion for the first Sunday of Advent. We've started a new church year. The church year always starts off with the Advent season. Advent season is the time when we prepare for Christ's coming. But we're not preparing for the baby Jesus to come at Christmas. That happened roughly 2,000 years ago. Instead, during the season of Advent, what we're doing, especially with this first Sunday, our theme is getting ready for the end. We're not waiting for Jesus to come as a baby. No, we're coming. We're waiting for Jesus to come in the clouds on that last day. Because Jesus already came. But we have his promise that he's going to come again. He's going to come both to destroy and to save. So what he wants us to do is to get ready. We begin. O Lord, teach us your ways that we may walk in your truth. You comfort and help us day by day. We trust in your loving care. You are the King of heaven and earth. We give you praise and thanks. Alleluia. We have come into the presence of God, who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and his punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all of your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. We pray the prayer of the day. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come. Protect us by your strength and save us from the threatening dangers of our sins. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first lesson on this first Sunday in Advent is from Genesis chapter 6. We read the select verses shown. This is what happened when mankind began to multiply on the face of the earth. When daughters were born to people, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took as wives for themselves any of them they, cho they chose. The Lord said, My spirit will not struggle with man forever, because he is only flesh. His days will be 120 years. The Lord saw that the wickedness of mankind was great on the earth, and that all the thoughts and plans they formed in their hearts were only evil every day. The Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with sorrow. The Lord said, I will wipe out mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth, along with the animals, the creeping things, and the birds of the sky, because I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is the account about the development of Noah's family. Noah was a righteous man a man of, in of integrity in that generation. Noah walked with God. Noah became the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. In the sight of God, the earth was morally corrupt, and the earth was filled with violence. God looked at the earth and saw that it was corrupt, for all flesh was corrupt in all their ways on the earth. So God said to Noah, I have decreed the end of all flesh because the earth is filled with violence because of them. Now I am going to destroy them along with the earth. Make an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark, seal it inside and outside with pitch. I myself am about to bring a flood of waters on the earth in order to destroy all flesh under the sky that has the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth will die. But I will establish my covenant with you. You shall come into the ark, 
you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. You shall bring a pair, male and female, of every kind of living flesh into the ark with you to keep them alive. Include the birds according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, every creeping thing on the ground according to their kinds. Two of every sort shall come to you so you can keep them alive. Take with you every type of food that is eaten and store it for yourself so it can be used as food for you and for them. So that is what Noah did. He did everything that God commanded him just as he had been told. This is the word of our God. Our second lesson for today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We read verses 3 through 9. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of the grace of God given to you in Christ Jesus. You were enriched in him in every way in all your speaking and all your knowledge, because the testimony about Christ was established in you. As a result, you do not lack any gift, as you eagerly wait for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also keep you strong until the end, so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, who called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the word of our God. Our gospel for this first Sunday in Advent is from Mark chapter 13. We read verses 32 through 37. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Watch. Be alert and pray, because you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going away on a journey. When he left his home, he put his servants in charge and assigned what each one was to do. He also commanded the doorkeeper to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house is coming, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or early in the morning. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, keep watch. This is the gospel of our Lord. One of the oldest traditions at Christmas time is that of putting up a Christmas tree. It's become so much a part of our our Christmas celebration that it just wouldn't seem like Christmas without a tree. Trimming the tree, decorating the tree, it's a happy and exciting time. Right? You start with a, an ordinary evergreen tree or, or an artificial one. You string up the lights, at least you used to. We put our own special ornaments on the branches as we think about memories of, of past Christmas celebrations. Maybe we play some Christmas music in, in the background or sing a familiar Christmas carol while we're decorating. And it all adds up to, to a warm glow inside that's, that's hard to explain. Soon that ordinary tree has been transformed into a centerpiece that really becomes the focal point in our homes the entire Christmas season. Ever since it was first used, the Christmas tree has been a reminder of Jesus, of his birth. For centuries, the evergreen tree has become a symbol of eternal life that God gives through Jesus Christ to all who believe in him as their savior from sin. And the tree gets decorated with lights to remind us that Jesus is the light of the world. That he is the source of hope in a dark and sinful world. Over time, ornaments were were added to show the joy that we have in knowing Jesus. Although it's, it's the largest Christian symbol people will ever have in their homes, many people really don't make a connection between the Christmas tree and the Christ of Christmas. But for those who do make this this connection, it means that and even more. In the Bible, God tells us that his, his family of believers, his church, it's like a tree. Each of us is like a branch that has been grafted onto the main stem, Jesus Christ. 
And just as we decorate our Christmas trees with, with lights, if we don't have a pre-lit one, but with lights and ornaments to display the beauty of God's eternal love in Christ. So the Lord gives each of us gifts of faith that display the beauty of Christ's love at work in our hearts and our lives. As we decorate our Christmas tree, the, the Lord decorates, adorns his church. If you, look at, if you look closely at Paul's introduction to his letter to the Corinthians, if you start at verse 1, you'll notice that the name of Jesus appears eight times. Paul was convinced that Jesus is the centerpiece of God's salvation and the centerpiece of a Christian's life. Is that what Jesus means to you and to me too? If you recall what was going on in that, that Corinthian congregation, you know why Paul uses so much ink in just the introduction, spelling out Jesus' name over and over again. See, the Christians in Corinth were becoming less and less Christ-centered. They were kind of a dysfunctional family trying to put up a Christmas tree. It was a disaster waiting to happen. It was kind of every man for himself in that congregation. There were cliques, there were hard feelings between members, there were nasty comments flying around about people's faith. Everyone wanted to be important and do his or her own thing. Everybody wanted his or her own opinion to be the only one and to be the right one. Each wanted to prove that they and their ideas were God's favorites. Instead of living in harmony, they were using each other in spiritual competition. And all of this left the congregation split in, in many ways. They were quickly losing their connection with Jesus because they were putting their focus somewhere else. And with a congregation that, that, that messed up, you'd expect to hear some scolding in Paul's introduction, but he surprises us with a warm greeting. Because, first of all, those Corinthians needed to focus on the centerpiece of their faith all over again. Paul begins our section with the words, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Those two words, grace and peace, sum up what every single human being needs most in life. Grace is the Greek word for gift. It's the word God uses to describe his undeserved love for you and me, for sinners. For instance, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. When you get a gift from your family or your friends, you don't have to pay for it. It's, it's already paid for. And if it is a gift, they want you to have it and not pay for it. If anybody is to be saved from eternal punishment we deserve for our sins, we needed God to pay for that gift and then give it to us free of charge because we could never buy it on our own because we could never afford it. All of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all our righteousness is as filthy rags, Scripture says. And the other thing that Paul starts off with is, is peace. Peace is the word God uses to describe the relationship he has with us now because of his grace. In another one of Paul's letter, he would explain, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you made friends with you, again is the picture, by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. See, if God had not settled the score and made peace with us, he would still be our enemy and we would be his enemy. He would have every reason to keep his distance from us forever. And now in this section, we find Paul giving away God's grace and peace like, like a Christmas present. And that's exactly what the angels did on the night Jesus was born, right? Glory to God in the highest and peace to men, all everybody, right, on whom his favor rests. See, what we need the most, what no money or time could ever buy, friends, God gives it to you for nothing, and he wants us all to have it. But don't miss that the fact that God's grace and, and more importantly, his peace they are only given in connection with Jesus Christ, the Son of God. 
again, it underscores the fact that Jesus is the centerpiece of our faith. In fact, Jesus is the centerpiece, centerpiece of the entire Bible. From, from eternity, God arranged all of history around Jesus. He created all things through Jesus. He announced the first words of rescue from hell and forgiveness of sins to the very first sinners in connection with Jesus, to Adam and Eve. The Holy Spirit inspired the entire Old Testament around the promise of the coming Messiah, of Jesus, that Savior. He inspired the entire New Testament to focus on the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And there's a lot of other stuff in there, but he hinges all of history, past, present, and future, the day of judgment, eternity, on just one person, the Lord Jesus Christ, and every other detail in the Bible furthers that goal of making Jesus Christ known. If there's one person we need, if there's any possible way to have our sin and guilt erased from our record, re record, if there's any hope of God's mercy or kindness, it will come, it must come, and it can only come through Christ Jesus. We call these Sundays before Christmas Advent. It's a word that means coming. The scripture lessons and, and sermons from God's word are going to turn our attention to the centerpiece of the Bible of, and of our faith, Jesus Christ, because Jesus is the reason for everything. And as he adorns us and our faith through his word and sacrament, the Lord adorns us to become the centerpiece of his grace. This is God's love for us, that we would be that important to him. One of the, most, one of the first things that most people say when they, when they visit each other's homes during the Advent and Christmas season is, is something about that Christmas tree, right? It's, it's kind of the highlight of the home. And each tree is as different, and it has a beauty all of its own. Well, the same can be said of every single Christian, right? A church's beauty, it isn't the building, it isn't the way we decorate it. The church is people. It's you. And God has adorned each one of us with Jesus' holiness, with his robe of righteousness, his, his robe washed in the blood of the Lamb, and with, that, with those clothes that he has put on us, we become beautiful in his eyes. In this world, only God can see our full beauty in Christ. But he has given a way to display some of that beauty to, to, your, fellow, to your fellow man. This is what Paul wrote, uh, meant when he wrote, I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking, and in all your knowledge, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Paul was writing to the Corinthians, but he was also writing about you and me when he said, Therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. Just like nobody sets up a, a bare tree in the living room without decorating, God not only grafts us into Jesus by faith, but he also dresses up our lives with fruits of faith. The spiritual gifts Paul is talking about are not just attached to us to make us look good on the outside. They are actually produced through us. God talks about it like fresh fruit on living branches. That's how God displays us as a centerpiece of his grace. Jesus put it this way in John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Another way that God describes some of the adornments of our Christian lives from Galatians chapter 5, he says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Take a look at the, the hectic, driven lives of the world around you, especially during this time, the, the holiday seasons. Anyone who displays the fruit of the Spirit is bound to be noticed, right? God kind of makes us into living Christmas cards at work, in the checkout line with our friends and relatives, with the members of our own congregation. He makes us a centerpiece of his grace to show others the peace God has made with them through that baby born in Bethlehem. The whole message about Jesus is what makes Christmas such a happy time. The good news about Jesus is why the angels sang and the shepherds rejoiced. The good news is is what makes Christmas songs so uplifting and some of our favorites. The good news about Jesus is what makes your life 
a life of peace and joy too. Someday this life on earth is going to end. We don't know when it is. But while we're waiting for that, we get to continually be God's ornaments in this life, his, his Christmas cards in this, in this world, showing what peace really looks like, showing what grace really looks like. Grace tells us what our Lord and Savior thinks of us, doesn't it? In spite of our weaknesses, our failings, our disappointments, our sins, our failures to be who, who God has created us to be in Christ, God sees us first and foremost as centerpieces of his love and his grace. He's proud of what Jesus has done for us and in us. We are at peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit wanted Paul to begin his letter to the Christians in Corinth by, by seeing them as God saw them, the centerpiece of his grace. And that's how God wants us to see one another too. We bring out the worst in others oftentimes by focusing on their shortcomings, on their weaknesses, on their differences. We discourage their faith when we think the worst first, don't we? God wants us to assume the best of our brother and sister in Christ, to take their words and actions in the kindest possible way, as Martin Luther put it. Give God glory and honor for the faith that he's planted in the hearts of your fellow Christians. Trust that he's not finished with any of us, with your neighbor and with yourself, but will continue to work in all of our hearts through the good news of our Savior to bring us more in line with that image of God. Focus on that centerpiece of your faith. That's how it happens. By focusing on that centerpiece of your faith, Jesus displays the splendor of his grace and peace in your life. This is how God adorns his church for Christmas. This is how God displays his saving grace in this world. Amen. We pray. Eternal Father, throughout the centuries, you repeated and affirmed your promise to send the offspring of the woman to crush the serpent's head. Through your prophets of old, you continually direct the eyes of your people to the coming of their Savior. We praise you, O Lord, for keeping your promise and sending your Son to destroy the works of the devil. As we prepare to celebrate the birth of your King, use your mighty word to shatter our pride and to rouse us from spiritual slumber and apathy. Move us to take to heart the words of John the Baptist, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. You sent your Son to redeem us from sin. Let this good news be our joy and strength. Use it to cheer the lonely, encourage the fearful, and give hope to the despairing. In these days before Christmas, spare us from the stress of deadlines and the frenzy of commercialism. Fill our lives with the message of your peace and the music of your grace. Direct our eyes not only to the manger, but also to the skies, where we will see your Son coming again, not as the lowly child, but as the Lord of Lords. Lift up our hearts in joyful anticipation of that day. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, in your grace, in your power, and in your glory. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Almighty and Merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless us and preserve us. Amen.